So um, I think this is one of the, f um, I think it is the first case series where we've actually looked at specific uh, uh, clinical um, uh, parameters in a whole series of cases in quite a bit of, quite a bit of depth. So first I want to um, thank once again the SJA Foundation who has actually supported, this is the, the third um, uh, one of these that, that I've gone to. There were two that were at Stanford. Um, Dr. Mellon sort of began the charge with uh, collecting these cases of lung disease and trying to figure out first with the clinical description as well as start talking about um, mechanisms. So um, I put on my initial slide all of the case reporters because this really does take much more than a village. It's taking a planet and we're finding the lung disease all over the world. We're hearing about other cases here that aren't really part of this case series. So, uh, And with that, I'm going to go pretty quickly because I'm not sure when I'm going to get the hook. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, okay. Um, so um, we were told at the beginning um, by Alexi about um, Yuki Kimura's case series. I won't go over that. The next two that um, we were we were um, part of was a multidisciplinary symposia that were at Stanford. One was um, uh, traditional in a con in a conference room for a day, and the um, next one was in March of 2016, which was a very interesting case based um, series where. There were people, many from this room, that, that um, hung out at a retreat for three days and looked at depth in these uh, cases. From that, we noted that there are all sorts of unusual features, but we really couldn't put something together. Uh, that then led to where I actually became more involved, uh, is to put together a retrospective observational case series, and we have some chronologic data, we've got some categorical data. And the entry criteria, you had to already have lung disease. So those that just seem to have a you know, little bit of breathing difficulties, we don't know what the spectrum is to be in this particular case series. You had to have an abnormal CT that we could review and or um, pathology that we could review. Also needed to have um, uh, diagnostic information so that we knew that this was SJIA or SJIA-like. And we decided, um, particularly from the Half Moon Bay retreat, uh, that those cases with or without arthritis that did or didn't meet all our criteria that were afforded the same approach to treatment was who we really wanted to study. Um, and then we wanted to have information that would be in association with the lung disease. So you couldn't have a remote history of SJIA and then show up two years into lung disease. We wanted to really query what happened around that time point. Um, the uh, radiology review is now um, uh, in process, so I don't really have much to tell you about that. Um, uh, the pathology review, Gail Deutsch is going to come on remotely from Seattle and she will show you the slides so I won't talk a lot about the path. So the key questions that we have is basically to describe what, what is this? What are the associated clinical features? Um, what is the pathology? Gail will go through that. Looking at the radiographic features, um, which I won't discuss today. Um, and then we wanted to see, are there any clinical subsets? Is there any way that we can um, uh, put a story together? And what I'm going to show you is unpublished and sort of the beginning of putting that story together. Because these are children that are um, immune suppressed, of course, we always worry about infections. So we put in what we could to query about um, the prospect that perhaps this is a lung infection. So getting to the results, there were 72 cases that were considered for inclusion, um, uh, excluded because they didn't either have the data, they didn't have the path of the CT, or they, didn't have, they actually had a different disease and a, and a different approach to treatment. So this was SJIA and SJIA-like, so there are those that do and don't have arthritis, and I can tell you that the range of arthritis is from none to severe. Uh, most of them do have arthritis. Some of them only get arthritis when the lung disease comes. Um, uh, there are two that are primary HLH, and we put those in because it's the same treatment approach, and then the, the genetic association is found in, into the course of treatment. Um, secondary HLH um, Fabrizio went, went through. We have a female predominance, and if you'll notice from the other, from the other um, uh, speakers, that SJA is, is, is pretty much um, equal gender. SJA-like is actually a little bit younger, a little bit more female, but this female predominance um, uh, crosses from SJA to the SJA-like cases. Um, what's um, uh, 
the reason that I brought up the trisomy 21, and I will look for that IL-17 article, I did see it yesterday, um, is that what is immunologically different about them? Because those of us who treat SJI, SJA don't see that every 10th patient has Downs. Well, in this series, every 10th patient has Downs, and they do have immune differences. They have differences in mucociliary clearance. They have differences in how their um, uh, lymphocytes function or don't function. A lot of that is not very well understood, but they're very enriched in this population, which, I, which is um, clearly of interest. Um, and like I said, the age, these are, these are really young kids. We have a wide range. We have children that are diagnosed at 17. I was just getting on the plane coming here and got a call about a new kid not in here who's 17 who has I, ILD and SJIA. Um, and we have very young children. We have those that I think began at five or six months of age that are SJIA-like. Um, so when did this happen? So um, as Alexi began um, uh, telling us about Yuki Kimura's uh, collection of 25 cases, uh, it, it looked like there was a signal after the advent of the new biologic. So how are these or aren't, aren't these associated? And, and I will show you that clearly there's some correlation with having these as part of the treatment paradigm, although we don't have any mechanism. This is just a descriptive study. So if you look at it, um, uh, pretty much all of them are, are since we've had these new, these new biologics. It doesn't mean that everybody who has membership in this was on the biologic at the time they got the, the, um, the ILD, but pretty much everybody was. So what about geographic distribution, um, season, and race? We've heard about amyloidosis and why the heck was that in Russia and Europe and never here. This seems to be um, uh, very international. And um, Anna Karen Horn told us um, yesterday that, she, that there are um, two cases that aren't part of this case series that seem very much that they should be. I know Paul Gilliman, our radiologist, was giving a talk in Indonesia. Someone came up and it's exactly the same thing. I think there's some cluster in Argentina that I'm hearing from press. So, so this is something that's permissive around the globe. So um, we, have to keep, we have to keep that in mind. We have all races represented, and those are the countries um, that, that we found this. Uh, the lung disease, when the time of onset is not necessarily the time when the biology begins. That's the time when the, when the case reporter said, there's something going on here. And it may have happened a year before, it may have happened you know, a day before, we don't know. So when you look at what, what, when it was um, recognized, that doesn't mean when the, when the pathology began. I think we need to keep that in mind. So the unusual clinical features, um, at the Half Moon Bay Retreat, one of the things that was, that was very um, iterative was acute erythematous clubbing. I've got a few other um, photos where you just have fat red digits. And it comes up like that. And there are rheumatologists who are saying, well, maybe I just didn't notice that. Well, I'm sorry. I believe in our rheumatologists a little better than that. We actually look at joints. We'll look at fingers. This is not a subtle finding. And it is cute, and, it, and it's erythematous. And some of it seems to go up and down um, uh, depending on what, what treatment you are and how your lung disease is doing. So there seems to be a little bit of reversibility for this. And it's all 10 digits. Uh, we've, we've heard um, over and over again about this reaction rate to tocilizumab. And I'll show you another slide that that doesn't mean that things are worse. It just means that, that those reactions do occur. And they tend to be pretty profound. And in, in most of these cases, um, they, can't, they can't continue with the tocilizumab. Tocilizumab is associated, that's like Temra. Tocilizumab is associated with um, infusion reactions at a rate of 10 to 20%. Many of those you're able to treat through. Most of these you, you can't. The significant abdominal pain is something that is um, uh, to the point where these children have had um, abdominal CTs, they've had endoscopies, they've had biopsies. There's been no explanation for it. Another case that's not in this series, case reporter, we don't have the case in the series yet, is from um, southern United States. Uh, and at uh, 3 o'clock in the morning, the child's abdominal pain got so severe, went to the um, emergency room. That child is four years old and has um, critical pulmonary artery hypertension. Um, and apparently that CT looks okay. We have another story um, like that, and although it's pulmonary hypertension, no lung symptoms, has a CT scan that, that looks pretty bad, just like the rest of ours. Um, so as we've heard... Um, uh, repeatedly that the respiratory symptoms can be anything from zero to um, acute profound hypoxia. Um, and there, and there's, there's a range, and that, that's really um, uh, held, held true. Cough seems to be sort of a heralding event, and when the case reporters say, 
I should have figured that out earlier. It's been something like a subtle cough. I mean, how many children will have a subtle cough? So it's, it's nothing, and it's not necessarily that it was bronchospastic, responded to anti-asthmatic therapy, or anybody even labeled it asthma. Um, sometimes the lung disease was entirely unexpected, and that includes a child in this case series who unfortunately extensive lung disease was found on autopsy. Um, so, so the range of this we're not, we're not really um, clear about. We don't know when it really starts. So Gail Deutsch is going to um, uh, come in remotely and she'll, she'll show us all the path findings. What we've done more recently is we've decided based um, predominantly on the path findings and some on, on the clinical and waiting to superimpose a radiology is to, is to put these into three groups. And I can tell you right here that I think there's a lot of overlap between the, these groups. I don't think this is defining anything that, that's really different. Um, with the exception in group three, we have two patients that have histoplasmosis. Um, one who had candida septicemia, one who had um, a bacterial lung infection and uh, septicemia and died. Um, but within that group, um, we have, there's nobody that has had um, uh, pulmonary artery hypertension and nobody who has a biopsy with significant pulmonary vascular disease. I show you the picture of the BAL because um, the proteinosis can be pr quite profound. Um, uh, most people would, um, even if you're not a physician, would assume that lung washing should not look like caramel. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. That's on the next, that's on another slide. Uh, actually, the description is there. It's a spectrum of the alveolar proteinosis and the endogenous lipoid pneumonia. The second one is pulmonary vascular disease. Either that you see that on biopsy and there's no um, alveolar proteinosis and it seems to be a vascular injury by biopsy and or these are children that have pulmonary hypertension diagnosed clinically treated, treated for that. Um, and then the other ones are those that either don't have a biopsy or have a biopsy that's different um, and, can't, and don't have any, any indication of pulmonary hypertension. They could have proteinaceous uh, um, um, BAL fluid, but we won't call that PAP unless we see it on biopsy. So those that are calling this PAP um, without a biopsy and no pulmonary hypertension, that would be a, you'd have membership in group three. This is, these, none of these groups does anybody want to have membership in. So now to looking at it um, uh, according to, um, wh when you look at Yukikimuras, there were, is this um, uh, more systemic um, illness? Um, uh, you really, you know, was this just harder, harder to treat? Um, it's not necessarily so. There are those that are persistently systemic. There are those in this case series who have never had steroids, who had disease that was um, seen that seemed quite simple to, to treat. There were those that were quiet for a period of time, either on, on medication, and we have a chilling case from the Northeast, where a child who was on the tender trial in tocilizumab um, was on tocilizumab for 18 months, started at age uh, one and a half, um, and was off of drugs since last fall, and in May, mom went to pick up this four-year-old at an activity, and she was short of breath, and she looked a little pale, and they looked as in she seemed to lose consciousness. They did a neurologic workup, nothing. She has critical pulmonary artery hypertension and she has a CT scan that looks like our group. She has no, no markers of inflammation. She's on absolutely no medication. And, and she now um, sadly has membership in the pulmonary vascular group. We don't have a biopsy. She may actually be in the PAP group. We, we don't know. She's only four. Um, the child from the south also uh, is a four-year-old who woke up with the acute um, abdominal pain. And that child was completely disease-free on canicimumab for six months. She had smoldering disease for the year leading up to this. I don't have all the numbers on steroids. I don't have the time for that. But just to let you know, the goal of steroid sparing was often achieved. Um, a period leading up to lung disease, there's inflammation. Again, we don't know when the lung disease started. Maybe that's part and parcel that the lung disease was there. We're not sure. Um, over at MAS was not typical in the prodromal period, although MAS clearly seems to characterize once they really um, uh, get into the lung disease. Um, it's a very steroid responsive um, treatment. So um, the mom who got up and said, we've got to give the steroids, and then the child gets better. We, we hear that story again and again. And in fact, sometimes the lung disease has been unmasked. As you diminish the steroids, you see that there's lung disease. Um, uh, and then uh, lymphopenia. So lymphopenia unexplained by MAS, because we looked at the same time for um, um, uh, hemoglobin, um, ferritin, 
um, and absolute lymphocyte count. We only ask for a few lab, uh, specific lab parameters on specific, you know, day of life and relationship because it's really hard to mine all these, these um, uh, charts. So we wanted this to be a doable, um, and it's a red cap database, Nora. Um, and the lymphopenia is profound. So since the normals are different for age and gender, we just normalized it based on age and gender. And in the, in the prodromal period, uh, lymphopenia can be, can be profound. Um, eosinophilia is another mark. So as, we, as most of us here know, that if you have eosinophilia and you give, and you give high dose methylprednisolone, poof, the eosinophils are gone. So these must be kids that really aren't on high dose um, uh, uh, steroid at, the, at that time. It's a, hard, it's a hard number to mine because um, you have to really go look at those CBCs, you have to look at the eosinophils, you have to look at the, the absolute count. But this is a, a single case. So if we know, I just added another one. It used to be 19 over 59, but a case report, I just brought it in that child had 1,700 eosinophils um, uh, a month and a half before lung disease. So um, if you look, the absolute lymphocyte count for this child was only 400. Um, lung disease was after. This is not only in percentage, this is in, in absolute numbers. So this is 2,000 count on eosinophils and 28, 28%. This is a time with this, um, some case reporters have called it um, a paritic eczematous um, uh, um, uh, horrifying eczematous um, rash that's incredibly difficult. There's one case in this series that because of the urticarial nature, they tried Zolaire, it didn't work. Um, and this ca and on, on biopsy, you don't see the eosinophils, even with this peripheral eosinophilia at the time. It's a nonspecific der uh, dermatitis. There have been some that have just sort of purple splotches. Only one of those was uh, um, biopsied, and it was also nonspecific. This happens in the prodromal period before they recognize that there any that there is any lung disease. This child, just to show you, was on normal doses of anakinra. Must have had, I forgot to look, must have had some arthritis, don't know whether they're coming on or off of Embril, and was on some steroid but not at huge doses. So when we look at these prodromal periods and we look at the fatality rate, we look at the features that lead up, I think there's a lot of overlap um, be, between these two sort of, our, these two of the three, three groups that I think group three, the three then, which is less uh, clearly characterized. Um, uh, has some that have membership within these two groups. So the first one with the spectrum of um, alveolar proteinosis and endogenous lipoid pneumonia, we put it that way because there are pathologists that say, do not call this PAP, because it takes you down um, a wrong therapeutic clinical think. This is not um, a surfactant mutation. This is not anti-GMCSF. This is very patchy. This is a lot of acute alveolar injury on the BALs that, I'm not, that I don't show you. Um, the cellular sloughing is phenomenal. So the getting the BAL cell counts is very difficult. You can have um, you know, 25 to 35 to 55 percent sloughed cells in the BAL when you're doing the cell count. And you'll have to normalize out to just look at what the, um, the cellular differential is. And it can be all confounded because the cells, of course, can then be adhered to um, uh, the sloughed dead cells within the BAL. It's a very different pathology, although it is lipoproteinaceous in a number of, the, a number of these cases. And, and if you look at the low um, uh, absolute lymphocyte counts, you look at the eosinophilia, which I say can be profound. We've got one that's up to 13,000 eosinophils. These are ones that, that people will stand up and take notice. Um, that the atypical rash is prominent, and that the clubbing, I didn't put in the, the differences between the acute erythematous clubbing and, and just clubbing. Some of them, uh, they note erythema, some of them don't. Some of them seem to be more reversible, but the clubbing is a part of this. And the fatality rate between, the two, between these two groups um, is essentially the same. So in Yuki's, Yuki's case series, there was a lot of pulmonary hypertension. We all know that that, that, that can be fatal. Um, there are, um, we have fatalities that are, that are pretty pronounced in both, and I'm not convinced that, that if you don't have pulmonary hypertension now that, that you won't develop it, and I didn't put this slide here that shows the um, pulmonary vascular disease and the pulmonary hypertension tends to be in the older age group, and, and um, Chris might be able to tell us a little more of the pathophysiology on why that's more. He just grimaced, maybe not. <laughs> Okay, and so what, ab what about these new inhibitors? Since we've noticed it since the advent of these new um, uh, uh, medications, we have to take a look at that. And I can tell you from looking at the case series, you could have had SJIA in 1992 or 1998. 
the, the um, lung disease happens in time course in relationship to when you have the new biologists and you have these new treatments. Um, and I can tell you it'd be, really, it'd be really terrible if we would have to give these up altogether because they've been really life-saving in numbers of cases. So I think that if this holds true, my hope is that we can just learn how to use them smarter. So we'll get onto that sort of sensibility slide that somebody showed. Um, so the overall exposure before or after lung disease is almost everybody. There are two cases that were never exposed. There were some different features about those children. Um, there were um, three that, um, uh, I'm looking at this star then goes to the fatalities on IL-1 or IL-6 at death. There are those that sort of showed up. They seem to have some kind of lung disease and SGIA. They go on to um, uh, this in, in inhibition. Some of them die, some of them don't. Um, but there is, there is an association during the fatality that, that these drugs are there. Again, this isn't mechanistic. This is simply correlation. Um, and the time, if you, when you get lung disease and, and to death, our median time in, um, is uh, 1.6 years. So greater than 75% of the cases have the onset of the lung disease in the first year of exposure, and there are a number that have it in that first three to six months. So um, it's a pretty chilling statistic. So which one of these? Well, as, as we know from all the panelists, uh, you sort of course through various ones of them. I'm going to jump down first to the bottom um, uh, box, and that's on the tocilizumab, because I wondered, could that be an, an, an index, that there's really some, something different and that, that this would be more fatal if you have a problem with tocilizumab? It doesn't hold up that um, there is a high degree of exposure to tocilizumab in this group as there is generally in SJIA. The reaction rate is clearly in excess of what one would expect with this medication. Um, but, the, but the death rate, um, if you're exposed, the death rate, if you have a reaction, is no different from the rest of the group. So I, I don't think that we can impugn anything different in terms of outcome uh, based on exposure to tocilizumab. Um, and when you look in the top box, I tried to see, well, you know, if you're, if you're young, and young is less than three years, which is most of our kids, um, um, not young at onset and, and young at onset. So if you look, there's exposure to all of the medications, and, and you can't really blame one or the other. So hopefully my timing. So then we, we did investigate for is there um, lung infection. And we looked for you know, bacterial sepsis and things as well. But you can really query lung infection a little bit peripherally more if you have um, some investigation of lung tissue itself. A lot of these children did not have a BAL or a lung biopsy um, at the time that the lung disease began. And some didn't have no instrumentation until like a year into it. So it's a little hard to ask this question. And so with the limited amount of data we have, um, we're not seeing bacterial other than that child who had the coag negative staph, septicemia, and lung infection who died. Mixed respiratory flora is not really um, here or there. Um, viruses in this immune compromised um, uh, cohort, yes, there are viral illnesses. Some of them had, had a, what was called viral pneumonia, some documented a virus, some didn't before they noted there was lung disease. Um, I want to look at a couple things on fungal. I think that that's a bigger um, uh, signal because fungal lung disease is pretty unusual. There are two cases that had histoplasmosis. One was a child with SJI life disease, hadn't, didn't have arthritis until she began, or clubbing until she began to have lung disease. That was histoplasmosis. That child came off of all the immune suppression. That child was treated for histo. That child is doing very well. And that was the first episode of MAS, but I think that secondary um, HLH is what Breach was talking about, infectious related. Another child was an entirely well, I think he was about 10 years old, comes in with ILAR, um, uh, fulfills full uh, ILAR criteria. Um, as SJIA, had lung disease at the onset. That child has, had um, uh, histoplasmosis. Um, and I don't think had acute, had acute clubbing. That child is, is alive, and that might have been the inciting event for SJA. That child remains on tocilizumab. I circle the pneumocystis PCR because there are a number in this room who have heard about what the heck is it with a relationship to survival and Bactrim, because um, we don't really see pneumocystis. So the, when you test for pneumocystis, you, you really require to have um, a, some investigation of the lung. You can have a 1,3-beta D-glucan serum test, and there are those that, um, that this was positive. Um, uh, and, and that was at least one child who was PCP-PCR positive. Only six children had uh, PCP-PCR um, uh, tested, and that was on BAL or ET aspirate. Two were already on Bactrim prophylaxis, and as expected, that would be negative. 
the four that had this were positive. And then, the, you know, the naysayers about pneumocystis, and I'm, I'm a, I'm, I'll, t I'll tell you why I'm somewhat of that group, um, are that you don't see it on fungal staining. You can't find it on uh, direct fluorescent antibody tests. Gail will tell you that she took any material that she had that she could do DFA on. You're not seeing pneumocystis. Um, um, uh, however, there are children that this looked like acute pneumocystis disease. We heard that about um, Ella. The reason that I s suggested to Suhas that you look for pneumocystis is, I think it's actually a comorbidity. I think it's a, I think that you have goop in the lung. Pneumocystis is there. One three beta deglucan is an incredibly um, uh, inflammatory molecule. You'll get an incredible response. These kids have outsized inflammatory response. And pneumocystis can be a bad actor even if it's in low. Um, uh, low organismal um, burden. Um, I am um, uh, very surprised and very happy that the, uh, the last child on this is actually um, at home. Um, she had a very rocky course, and she was um, fun to tell positive and PCP-PCR positive, and um, obviously an extremis. Um, when you treated these children, um, the one that's deceased who had just started Bacter number three, um, uh, uh, number three on this list, her erythematous clubbing um, receded after a course of Bactrim, even though she was PCP, PCR negative. She was then re-hospitalized and um, had reconstituted her immune cells and died a horrible inflammatory death. So here's another picture of this acute erythematous clubbing. This is something that, that I don't think anybody in this room, parents included, would, um, uh, would um, miss. So what we noted was that there is fatality when you don't have Bactrim, yet we're not seeing pneumocystis. So again, I think that we don't know when the lung disease occurs. And I think you have abnormal physiology in your lung disease. You have abnormal um, uh, clearing of pro lipoproteinaceous material. And, and I think that you are um, a likely host for pneumocystis. So I think that having the Bactrim there and correlating quite strongly with survival um, I think probably sadly, um, uh, doesn't mean that this is pneumocystis. And I say sadly because pneumocystis is not a great illness, but it would, be, it would be good if we could have something that maybe was different, like TNF um, inhibitors change the way TB looks. I, I think it would actually be nicer if the IL-1, IL-6 inhibition changes the way that something like pneumocystis looks like. But, but I, th I think that it's just a marker that it's there, and unfortunately, I don't think that explains it. But if you'll, you'll look that if you have um, uh, uh, prophylaxis for pneumocystis, which is pretty much um, trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole, um, Bactrim, just in prophylactic doses, that, um, that you're alive. And, and those that don't have the prophylaxis, there's um, one in group one who I'm pretty sure is now on prophylaxis. I've spoken with this case reporter a few times, and I think they talked the family into being a little bit of a believer. And, and if you look in group two, which is pulmonary vascular um, disease, why I think there's a lot of overlap, we have the same sort of signal. The one that was, um, uh, that died on prophylaxis was um, a child who, you, know, you, you sort of hear in the ICU, we were terrible, we didn't, we didn't give the, the medications while we were on, on vacation. So, I, so although it was prescribed, you really never know adherence. A, as well as, this is something that's not given very um, frequently on the Bactrim, and not to tell families not to give it, but you talk with the pneumocystis experts, a little bit of PCP prophylaxis goes a long way. So if, if there's a, a you know, slip up and you don't take one dose, it doesn't mean that you're poof gonna get MAS, you're not poof gonna get new Assistance. So it's a pretty simple treatment. So um, to wrap this up, um, we're seeing a worldwide um, occurrence. We're seeing it at all races. I think this is underreported. We don't know the spectrum of the illness. Um, uh, it's recognized in winter. There might be um, an unmasking event, like you get a respiratory illness, you don't have the reserve, and now you see there's something else going on. I'm not sure that's when the lung disease actually starts. This does have a correlation, but we don't have a mechanism associated with the advent of the IL-1 and IL-6 um, inhibitors. But it's related to the year of um, uh, starting that, relates to the year of onset and times to um, uh, the lung disease. Um, uh, high fatality is strikingly higher without um, prophylaxis for pneumocystis. Um, there's a spectrum of unusual um, clinical features, and I think the pathology can overlap. I don't know what the, what the denominator is for eosinophilia, 
Um, in SJI in general, I don't think we've taken a good look at that. I can't say for sure, although I would expect that we saw 32% eosinophils, we would have noticed that. When you look more at a percentage that gives you pronounced eosinophilia and the other you know, one to 2,000 range of eosinophils, I think that that could possibly be, be, be overlooked. Um, growth arrest is under analysis. Um, I, I have a sense that it's steroid related. So I think it's in the young kids that never got off of steroids, but we will do that analysis and haven't done that yet. Um, and then there, we haven't really found an obvious infectious cause. Uh, and it's been a little hard to figure out how to do that analysis. So uh, with that, um, I want to make sure that give the acknowledgement to um, uh, Betsy, who, as all of you in the, in the room know, started this, this, this whole project and sort of engineered it, at least the Stanford involvement a number of years ago. Um, I um, uh, have to give, um, uh, certainly uh, acknowledge um, Gail, who's going to be on soon, our radiologists that are um, looking at uh, the pulmonary manifestations on the CT scan. We're working with our biostatistician. Our case reporters have been really incredibly involved, and I can't thank, thank them enough. We wouldn't have this information. Um, and then I, there are all sorts of consultants that I I don't have a full list down there, as, as well as the SGI Foundation, CARA, um, the Child Network, Systemic uh, JI Foundation, of course, and the Arthritis Foundation. So I'm ready for fire away with questions. <laughs> Okay, I will hurry up. So thank you for your fantastic talk. I will take the opportunity to ask a question from a clinician's point of view. Sure. I uh, am afraid I perhaps will have another case because I have a three-year-old boy with um, non-typical you know, typical systemic GIA that uh, he presented as MAS. Uh, he's on Anakinra. Uh, we have been able to take it to twice uh, every second day. If we take it away, he flares. And he, in the summer, had a severe rash. He also had abdominal pain. He has an unknown uh, cause where he had high eosinophils. I checked, you know, all the labs for his uh, gastro if he has something that causes this. And I can't find any cause. Now his eosinophils have gone down, but they've been very high. So when I read this, you know, the rash, the uh, abdominal pain, the eosinophilics, yeah. is he going to be my third case? And, you know, should I... Start. He doesn't have any breathing symptoms at all. At the moment, he's doing well on Anakinra uh, every second day. And he's three years old. He's three years old, and he had severe MS, yeah. atypical in uh, April, and in the summer he had this uh, just the recent uh, six weeks ago. He was just rash, abdominal pain, high eosinophilia. So I think I'm first going to start with um, with with a question, and then I'll I'll get to to an answer. So the question is: when we when you see that there is this um, survival associated with Bactrim, which means that um, with the lung disease we think there's a risk for bad things, most likely with pneumocystis. This shouldn't be nocardia because we think it's gamma interferon high, and when you have CGD. Um, uh, you give gamma so you don't get nocardia. But nocardia is a bactrim-sensitive um, uh, organism as well. Since we don't know when the lung disease starts, we seem to time it in this group of kids that, that we give IL-1 or IL-6 inhibition. Should we be starting bactrim from the get-go? Because if it's just the exposing um, uh, event, uh, pneumocystis or something else, um, that tells us that the lung disease is there and we don't know when it starts. We can't think that we can start back from when we know there's lung disease. So given this, I'm not asking you will you do it, I'm asking do you think we should give thought to at the get-go starting um, with Bactrim? Is there any kind of show of hands in among the clinicians? Can I ask a more provocative question? But, but then I want to answer hers. <laughs> and then you can get a provocative question. But anyway, so that's really, you don't have to answer. But, but so I would say, you know, first seeing this, you know, of, of course, you know, I have, um, uh, you know, a, a stone cold fear of this that I, that, I, that I would think that a case like that should be on Bactrim. One. Uh, two, when, you, when you're going to look, you should talk with the um, pulmonologist. Uh, that child may have hypoxia that, that you don't recognize because there can be profound hypoxia and a paucity of symptoms. 
And in a three-year-old, I don't know if that's an, um, an overnight um, pulse oximetry study, um, certainly just doing a pulse ox would, would be helpful. Um, and if you look for um, uh, tachypnea, sometimes that's very under-recognized and that can also, also be there. Um, when, do you, when do you have that child go to a sedated CT um, scan? Um, I have the fear of God from this, so I would say do a CT scan. And I don't know how many, um, yeah, and I, I don't know how many unnecessary chest CT scans we will do in young children before we figure out who really needs it. And I would do a cautionary note that if for some reason there is some pneumocystis there, when you kill the organism, and I would, and I would posit that maybe even low burden of organism, because these kids are so inflammatory, the 1,3-beta D-glucan is released. Um, and that gives you an incredible inflammatory response. So if you actually have pneumocystis in an immunocompromised um, uh, uh, person, you expect a, an outsized inflammatory response that can look exactly like MAS and, and require steroids and, and perhaps heroics. Um, but I would, I would be careful of that. In, in terms of how to make it go away, I wish I could tell you. Okay. So we're Chris? On any of the patients that you have the data, the uh, lymphopenia, is the CD4, CD8 ratio flipped? So um, it's, a, it's a very good question. Most of them um, uh, did not have um, uh, looked at lymphocyte um, subpopulations. I do have a few that in the course of disease, and the CD4 is low. Um, uh, I think there are two that I know of, but I didn't ask for that level of de detail. I have it on... Um, uh, a case who's come to Stanford and a, and, a, and a case who was a Stanford case. The other thing is that there is a child who, completely off of medications, um, also had um, uh, lymphopenia. I don't know whether that child started off with lymphopenia, and I was sort of thinking that maybe we're hit, hiding in here some idiopathic CD4 lymphocytopenia as a primary immune deficiency. But without knowing what the lymphocytes were before they had SGA, you don't know if that's an, on, an ongoing um, effect. So, wait, Chris had a provocative question. Oh, there's another one there. Okay. I want Chris's provocative question, too, before we end. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm Kathleen Lomax. Um, many of you know me, but not everyone. I'm from Novartis Med Affairs, and I think I'd like to speak for Christina from Sobe, too. If you ever please report these cases to the companies. I know many of you um, have reported them to the FDA via MedWatch. I've been in Med Affairs for over a decade. I just realized, my safety team told me, and it's the same with Sobe, if you send it to the FDA, it never gets to us. It's a black box. Why does that matter? We have really great surveillance in-house, but if you don't tell us the case exists, we, we have no way of assessing it and helping and trying to find a signal. Right now, I can, again, because we got the, we've seen no signal in our databases. And, you know, we just did this 10,000 patient study in the cardiovascular space with LRs. Totally different population. But, you know, we, if there's a signal here, we really want to know and we want to help. But if you don't tell us the case, we can't help you. So that's just my request. Any medication, if in, remotely, you don't have to think it's related to the medication, but if you let us know, um, honestly, we might be able to help. So, Kathleen, I have a, qu I have a question. So I asked all the case reporters Ladies, to, su really to sorry, submit a med we're, watch. We're, we're way over time. Like, okay. way. So, Chris will have to ask me to provide a question. Go ahead and address. Chris has a talk right after yours, yeah, so, so he can. can... Thanks. I'm, I, we, we, have some, we have a remote speaker, and I'm trying to keep us on time for that, out of respect to that person and everyone in this room. So Chris has time coming up. Um, Vivian, I'd love for you to give your answer to this question, and then we need to move yeah, on. Yeah, wa what I want to know is whether the drug companies themselves has a form, and then you'll send me that link, and I can send it out to the case supporters. A lot of these cases have, were on all four of them, including Relanocept. So it was easier to have them do MedWatch. And, and I thought it went to you, and I'm a little horrified that it doesn't. I agree. It was horrifying. <laughs>